the thing that is somewhat different with technology is that potentially what you have created is a playground that is as big as the world and as tall or as deep or as wide as you want it to be. So I think part of the role of parents is creating those fences, those boundaries, those streets that we used to know, you're not allowed to go past this street or past this street or past this stoplight or whatever. You're listening to the smartsocial.com podcast. I'm your host, Josh Oaks. This is our district talk segment where we interview district leaders to learn how they're keeping students safe on social media so those students can someday shine online. Now let's get back to the interview. Hi, I'm Jared Cotton. I'm the proud superintendent for Chesapeake Public Schools in Chesapeake, Virginia. We're in southeastern part of the state, and we have approximately 40,000 students across 48 sites. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Faust. I am the Chief Technology Innovation Officer at Chesapeake Public Schools. Great to have both of you here today with us. My first question for you here today is, what current technology is your school district using that you're finding helpful in the classroom? I'll be glad to start us off. There's so many things that we have going on in our classrooms and schools that we're excited about. We do have some programs that we're using in our schools right now that are helping us personalize learning for students so that we're assessing students and personalizing their instructional program. Dreambox is an example of one that we're using. But beyond that, we've done a really good job of providing one-to-one -one technology to our students over the last couple of years. So now all of our students are using Chromebooks and they have access to devices each and every day for instruction. And we've also been really excited to implement smart boards or but interactive panels in all of our classrooms and all of our instructional spaces. So we have a lot of technology innovations that we've just put in place over the last few years that we're really excited about. Love that. That's great. Jeffrey, what are some of your takes on the technology that you're using right now? Yeah, we, we've made a pretty substantial effort in the past few years to make sure that the technology we're deploying is consistent and that we've done it with fidelity across the division. Dr. Cotton mentioned one-to-one -one devices, but additionally, we've really worked to make sure that our platforms are working together as well. So our LMS, which is critical to the function of instruction, the panels that Dr. Cotton mentioned are now in every single classroom across our division. And then also using a single sign-on solution in order to get our staff and students to the resources that we're putting forward. So trying to make sure that with technology we're deploying, not only is it everywhere, but it's easy to access and get people to the resources we want them to get to with as little obstacles as possible. That's a really successful approach from what I'm hearing. My next question I have for the both of you is, how are you using that technology that you reference and the resources that you have to enhance student learning and engagement? Yeah, that's such a good question. And one of the things that we always fall into as educational leaders is we focus on adding technology and purchasing the next cool thing or the next new thing, which we all get excited about. You know, we're all like little, little kids at heart, really, when we look at all the new technological innovation, but we don't just want to add technology to add technology. It has to be woven into the instructional program. It has to be tied in with learning objectives. They need to be integrated, which is something we've spent a lot of time in Chesapeake Public Schools, making sure that we are integrating technology as a part of instruction. It's a seamless integration. It's not something that's separate. It's something that's a part of the instruction. We weave it into our assessments. We weave it into our instructional objectives from day to day. What we learn from technology is that it really enhances what's happening in the classroom. It really takes it to the next level. And that's where you have the five C's we talk a lot about in our school division, critical thinking, creative thinking, collaboration, communication, and citizenship, of course. All of those come into play as we're integrating technology in the classroom each and every day. And of course, Jeff and his staff are very much involved in supporting that work. Jeff, can you dive in a little bit more specifics about how you're using the technology you talked about with also the five C's and, and to enhance student learning. Is there anything you've seen that's really enhancing in more detail? I, I would be remiss to not call out uh, some of the excellent work done by our CTE department around this, not just for CTE specific classroom, but they've really done a great job of infusing computer science, especially at our middle school level. That's one where I think the prevalence of technology and the systems working together has really been a, been a real uh, paramount experience for our students and teachers alike. We're pretty much all, if not all of our middle schoolers are getting some exposure to computer science 
it's a widespread program and they're doing robotics, they're doing programming, they're doing competitions and the real world skills development that's happening along with those programs and that exposure for middle school kids really helps students to go, well, now that I'm in high school, what, what am I interested in? One of the worst things that could happen, I think, is you get to high school and you get presented with an engineering course and a student goes, well, what's engineering? I've not had any exposure to that till now. So as long as we can get kids understanding what things are, it doesn't mean that every student of ours is going to be a computer scientist or a programmer or a developer or an engineer, but at least they have the information they need to make that determination when making some of those critical course choices in high school and beyond happens. Yeah, I love what you just said. Allowing students younger and younger to discover what's available to them out there. And, and that's really what you two have hit on right now is we have all this incredible technology and doesn't that get back to it? It's all about, at Smart Social, I'm always saying FTK for the kids. This is why we do this. And you're, you're allowing them to see the roads ahead at a younger and younger thing, which, which I absolutely love. That's a big part of our mission here as well. The next follow-up question I have for you and this is where we give some advice to other districts, uh, which is kind of fun. It's time to, to really help districts. I'm thankful for both of you being on here. Superintendent, what advice do you have for other school districts to deal with social media issues that may originate on a social media app, but then create a very real problem on one of our campuses? You know, our administrators would say that that's been one of the things over the past few years that's really taken a lot of their time away from the core mission and, and purpose of our schools that it's been quite the distraction. Before we had one-to-one -one devices available to our students, we had a bring your own device to school, which is where a lot of our students brought their cell phones and were able to use those in class with teacher permission. Lots of school divisions kind of went down this road where you have green areas where you can use your device without permission, yellow with permission, red was a no zone. What's been interesting for us is we've actually limited, and I know this might sound crazy, I think it's a trend that's happening more and more now with social media. We've limited the use of cell phones in our buildings, which kind of seems counterintuitive. But what we have found is that our students were so distracted on their phones during the day that it was actually taking away from the learning experience. We did implement just this past year, often away during the day, cell phone policy for elementary, middle schools, high schools. They can use them during certain times of the day. But for the most part, they're not using them because now we have one-to-one -one devices in place. But I would also tell you that we have really worked hard to engage our parents in helping us with social media and the dark side of social media. As a matter of fact, we have a parent webinar that we have coming up. And what we have found, surprisingly, is during the pandemic, we started doing more webinars for our parents. We actually have more participation through the webinars than we've ever had in person. And then we make those into podcasts so they can watch later. We have one coming up in the next couple of weeks on the dark side of social media to help our parents monitor better because I can't tell you how many times our parents come to meet with us and they had no idea their child was on social media or what they were sharing or doing on social media. And so we're really trying to target our parents, but also we spend a lot of time talking to students about being responsible on social media. And that's something that we've actually worked into our our curriculum. I want to do a follow-up question there because you, you brought up some fascinating information, some rabbit holes, as I call them, we could dive into. The limited use of cell phones, and the, for the, our viewers right now that are listening or watching, we've heard of a lot of principals and school districts and superintendents saying, this is going to sound crazy, but we're getting these bags and students are putting their phones in the bags of the lockers. Mm -hmm. And we have a, a digital citizenship agreement where it's a cell phone agreement, no phones. And they're doing these test runs. And I have a principal a couple months ago that's one of our partners that she said, all the parents said, hey, the kids are complaining less at home. I bet you got rid of that rule, huh? My kids are allowed to use cell phones. And she goes, no, they just started enjoying it. No, the no cell phone policy. I'd like one of you to comment on what, are, what is the feedback you're getting the people on the street, the teachers who are actually dealing with the kiddos, either one of you can comment on this. Hey, here's what we heard. Here's the first two weeks was hard on this limited. Like, give, I want you to give advice and, and insight into other districts of what did you find when you took away those devices? It's a lot like sugar we find, right? And there's like three weeks of, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm not doing this. I'm starving to death. And then you go, actually, life's a little bit better. So can one of you please comment on what you're hearing, a person on the street from closer to the kiddos, what the teachers are telling you? 
I'll start, but I'm going to pass it to Jeff because Jeff was very instrumental in working with stakeholders to make this decision. Because I just want to paint a picture for you. We didn't just make a decision based on what we thought. We spent time talking to students. We had student focus groups. We met with our student leaders to get their feedback. We met with principals. Jeff put a committee together to get feedback from teachers, staff, parents, students. So all of that together helped us come to this place. But I will tell you this, that you're exactly right. It was like we took something away from them, like we took the sugar away and they were very upset at, at first. But then what we found happened was the principals reported to me, they were so impressed that the students were actually engaged in conversations. They said they took out board games during lunch and started playing in the cafeteria and they felt like they had gone back in time that now the students were interacting and having face-to-face -face conversations. And Jeff, you might want to add to that because I know you've been gathering some information as well. I think that was one of the most stark pieces of feedback we received. In addition to, to the work that Dr. Cotton mentioned we have done, we, we also did a full literature review out there. There is research emerging, but th the problem is it is just emerging. You don't have 10 years of research on this topic yet, but there is research out there that suggests what is or isn't good for children and, and how cell phones do or don't affect educational attainment. And so using all of that and using the committee, we, we came up with a pretty clear idea of what was going to be best for our kids in school. It was one of the first pieces of like, you won't believe this kind of feedback I got, which was I had a principal invite me. He said, you need to come to the high school during lunch. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, you need to see the lunchroom. I'm like, well, what do you mean? He said, you don't understand. You know, two years ago, lunchroom was just full of kids with their heads down with their, in there looking in their lap while they were eating food. Literally, they would sit across the table and not talk to each other. And he said, and now you come in and they're all, there's laughter. There's, they're talking, they're having conversations. And he said, honestly, I had forgotten what that was like until we put this new policy in place. And so to me, that was really a good reminder of the fact that we are human. We are social beings. And, you know, the nature of our social wiring is face to face. We have to remind ourselves of that. And I know like I'm, I'm the technology leader for the school division, but I try not to divorce myself from the realities of biology and, and how we got to this point as humans. So. It was healthy. The feedback has been very similar to what you said, which is at first a little shocking, but afterwards it was like, we, we feel like this has made huge positive benefit for our students and for our teachers alike. But one more thing, our behavior problems have gone down significantly since this has been put in place, because as you said earlier, a lot of the behavior issues and distractions are coming from social media and cell phone use. So those have gone down significantly. And I would also tell you what I was surprised to hear. Our parents have thanked mm. us putting this in place because our parents have been telling their children, you don't need a cell phone. You don't need to take a cell phone to school. And the other thing our parents have told us is the kids are texting them all day while they're at school. Well, the parents have thanked us for putting them away so that they can focus on what they're doing at work. So I thought that was interesting too. What great feedback. Okay, that was excellent. I'm so glad. Thank you for the, all those answers. So here's my next question that I have for you that a lot of school districts are, are going through. I, we've talked a lot about the safety and a little bit of the biology, maybe the fear of missing out or I'm on my phone and there's less interaction, but let's move into the positive side. Can you provide, one of you or both, provide some examples of how your students have used their social media in a positive or maybe even a productive way that can maybe benefit them now, or themselves or their community, or especially in the future? Give us some examples. I'm a big proponent of social media. As a matter of fact, when I first came to Chesapeake Public Schools, we were not utilizing social media very much at all. And of course, I said that's something that we really need to leverage as we're Expre expressing all the great things happening in our school division and promoting our school division. And so we started with Twitter, which is now, of course, X. And I remember we, we launched it as a school division in our first tweet and made a big to-do about it. And somebody said, welcome to the year 2000. They were teasing us for uh, taking so long <laughs> to, get, to get on social media. But anyway, we have Facebook up. We didn't have that before. We have encouraged our schools to use social media. And what we encourage them to do is tell our story. We need to tell all the great things that are happening in public education and our schools each and every day. And that's how I use social media 
I don't post about everything I'm doing in my personal life. I promote our schools when I go to events, when I um, meet with, with students, when I meet with staff. Uh, I like to document that and share information that was learned. And I like to record student performances and things like that. Just a way to share positive news. We have encouraged our students to use social media as well for good and not evil. And of course, we talk a lot about how important that is. Uh, we do have a grow our own program that we do where we actually pay students to do a paid internship in the summer. We have several students who participate with our communications department in the summer and they get paid to do that. And they have been instrumental in helping us with video creation, social media promotions, and that type of communication. I think what's the most important thing that we put out is now with social media, you're not just communicating to your class, you're communicating to the world potentially. So that really means that you have to be much more careful about what you say and much more accurate and credible. And so we do spend time talking about that as well. I would say the benefits and the, and the, the challenges of social media, really it's two sides of the same coin to my world, which is students can connect with anybody, which means that students who have a real cause, something they're extremely passionate about, but maybe there's not a local group, a local organization, a local nonprofit that's going to help them to chase that passion that they have. Because of social media, because of these opportunities, they can connect with like-minded individuals, which is a huge benefit and a huge opportunity. And, and we shouldn't ignore that reality. We can help our students to find their tribe, to find their way in life, to find the things that really ignite their, their passion. And to me, that's one of the greatest, you know, things that we hear those stories quite regularly about students who, you know, found a group, found a support group, found a passion project, you know, found a, an athletic club, a sport or something they never knew existed until they found it online or on social media. So I think that opportunity cannot be ignored. And we certainly see that within our schools. Now I want to dive into some parent advice. I, I'd like to see what your advice would be. What suggestions do you have for parents in your community and nationwide to encourage their kids to use tech in a positive way, both in the classroom and at home. I think it starts with guardrails. One of the examples that I've, I've used before, and this is the best example I have yet. And, and, and I'm sure there's other ones out there that are much better, but you know, as I, as a child growing up, I was able to go to the playground around the corner, but I wasn't able to go to the park in the next neighborhood, if you will. And the playground that I was allowed to go to had fences around it and there were houses around it and there were lights and there were things that allowed that playground to function in the way that I needed it to as a child and my parents wanted it to as parents. And the thing that is, is somewhat different with technology is that potentially what you have created is a playground that is as big as the world and as tall or as deep or as wide as you want it to be. So I think part of the role of parents is creating those fences, those boundaries, those streets that we used to know, you're not allowed to go past this street or past this street or past this stoplight or whatever. Um, we had those rules, I think, growing up. And now it's being asked of parents to create those rules in a digital world. And I'm not sure they all know how. So I think this starts with, are we talking about these things at home? Are we talking about what did you do today? If a child is on Facebook or on Twitter or on, you know, I know children aren't on Facebook or Twitter. I know there's 85 other social media platforms that I've never heard of that they're using and that's fine. But as a parent, you need to know what those are and you need to say, hey, what happened on, you know, Snapchat today? And, and I think sometimes that question is, did you learn anything cool? Did you, did anything make you happy? Did anything make you sad? Did anything make you confused? I think those are healthy conversations to have at home around the dinner table around technology so that we are aware of what, what is the playground? What does the playground look like? And what is the equipment on the playground? And I think that's the, the best, you know, analogy I have for today's day and age with how we take what we all maybe know and grew up with and apply it to the you know, the spaces where our children are spending some of their childhood today. Yeah. And that was so well said, Jeff. And I, I would agree. Our parents just don't know all of the social media apps that our students are on now. Just like Jeff said, they're not on X or Twitter or, or Facebook. They're on Snapchat or Instagram and uh, many others that I can't even name. But as parents, it's so important for you to, to have those conversations. Like Jeff said, talk to them, make sure they understand that you're not out to spy on them, but you need to, to know what apps they're using. You need to have access to anything at any time. 
so that they know that that they're not communicating in a way that that you're not aware of or uh, not comfortable with. And I think one of the challenges we have par- with parents is they say, don't use any of those apps at all. And then what happens is the students hide it and then they try to use them anyway. Yeah. And then that's where I can't tell you how many times we talk to parents and they say, I didn't know my child was on that app or I never heard of that app before. I didn't even know my child had access to that app. So I think those conversations are so important and, and paying attention. And then of course, one of the things I did, of course, my kids are all adults uh, grown now in their twenties and I have one in his thirties. And so it, it's been a while, but we had certain roles about where the cell phone would be placed on the kitchen counter at a certain time at night. <laughs> and of course we, we had some monitoring that we put in place. And of course that happened because at that time, one of my children was texting all night and I got a bill for almost a thousand dollars. I realized, I realized I need to pay a little closer attention, but anyway, I think those are the kinds of things that we need to help our parents understand. Just ask questions, pay attention, have those conversations mm-hmm. with your child, because anytime you're not doing that, then you need to be concerned about who they're talking, who they're communicating with and what apps they're using. So many follow-up questions that I won't ask, but, <laughs> but it, it, that's a normal parent thing is we had no idea and we discovered it this way. So parents, I, I also want to speak to our listeners right now. Uh, and I want to do just a gentle nudge to our current partners that are school districts all over the country who have asked us to these parent night events. Parents, if you're worried about the, uh, as Jeff just said, the 85 apps that you might not know about, keep in mind that Smart Social in your dashboard, you have 140 plus apps. So you can go through and just do a quick skim. We have what's called the green zone, the gray zone, the red zone, and the orange zone. Remember, parents, the green zone are the apps that have an upside. It doesn't mean they're a safe place to start to leave your kids. It's a safe place to start together. The green zone could be Instagram, where in high school, you can build a portfolio, a resume. You can connect with others with guardrails, as Jeffrey said, right? And then the gray zone for everybody is where there's intense messaging, private messaging. And that's where that's where Snapchat's going to be in. And all these areas where there's a lot of FOMO, like, oh, I saw this on Snap and my parents can't get in there. The red zone is full of apps and we bucket these because we want to make it easy for parents just like all of you watching right now. The red zone's full of a ton of apps that have anonymous behavior and the downside outweighs the upside. And I want you to think of each one of the zones of the apps like a park. If I asked you, would you feel comfortable with your kids going to a park in Central Park in New York? You'd be like, well, first of all, my kid is 13. Would it be daytime or nighttime and would I be there? All the great questions. They are parks. If you're there with your kids, even a red zone app can be kind of safe. It could be like a a park where you're like, this wouldn't be safe at night, but New York City is safe by day. No offense. I love New York. I love Central Park. I've been there so many times. But Central Park is great as a family zone. And there's Frisbees and it's fun. And then you take your kids home and you're there with them. So I want you to think of apps like that. Uh, They can always be safer wherever the parents are relevant. The orange zone at Smart Social for parents, you just log in. You're going to see all of the dangerous challenges, the rip apart the bathroom challenge the or devious licks and all these other ones that students are doing. It's ways for you to catch up. All right. I've got a big follow-up question for all of you. First of all, gentlemen, what are your suggestions and advice for other districts to increase parent engagement? We've done a lot in that particular area over the last couple of years. We have a new office called FACE, Family and Community Engagement, that we've really invested in. I think one of the things, and I hate to say that right off the bat, that you need staff focused on that because we don't have staff available that we can add, funding available to do that. What I did was I did some repurposing of some staff members we had in place, and I was also able to leverage some Title I funding to help uh, to have staff focus on parent and family engagement And I will tell you that what we did was we spent a lot of time trying to invite parents to events and to web workshops, and we just did not get the attendance that we had hoped for. So then we started leveraging the webinars, uh, which I shared earlier, and we started providing the webinars, and then our attendance went up dramatically, especially with the different topics that we were presenting. And we were presenting topics that we were hearing from our community were topics of interest. I mean, we just did a powerful workshop on the fentanyl epidemic where we had the one pill can kill, where we shared some information with parents. And that was so well attended and well received that we're offering additional sessions. 
I shared with you, we're doing the dark side of social media, but we've also done things like helping your child become a better reader, um, helping your child with math at home. And all of those things have been well attended. We record them and we post them. And we actually created something we call Peak University, which is our parent online modules of webinars and information and resources that parents can access at any time. And we've also partnered with the sheriff's department on some of our presentations, the health department. We have really brought in a lot of our partners to help us. As far as the in-person, we finally started figuring out a way to get more families to come in by personally inviting them. We actually had staff on bus ramps passing out personal invitations to come to an event. And we did that for our, our multicultural night that we had. And we had great attendance because parents received a personal invitation. So some of those strategies have been helpful, but I would also say that we've really invested in two-way communication with our families. We now use an app on our website that allows our families to communicate directly with us and share their information or communicate anonymously. And the nice thing about that is even if they communicate anonymously, which some of my colleagues might say, uh oh. All right, because you're going to get all kinds of things. But the nice thing is you can actually respond to them, even though you don't know who they are. We always tell them, if you tell us who you are, we can give you more information or follow up with you directly. But I would just say that those are just some of the things that we've done that have really been helpful. Uh, One of the pieces of feedback that I've heard, and I don't want to keep harping on the cell phone policy, but I've had middle school parents thank me for our cell phone policy because... One, it helped to facilitate the conversation at home about healthy cell phone usage. I've also had parents say to me, well, this is great. Now we can basically tell our child they don't need a cell phone because they can't take it to school anyway, which was a funny one. But I think a third one is schools across the country do a really good job with um, filtering and creating safe spaces on the school issued devices. So, you know, wherever there's a one-to-one device, and a one-to-one program, you also have built-in filtering agents that are making sure that the students, even when they take their device home, are hitting educationally relevant and appropriate sites and more of the, the non-educational stuff and or inappropriate content is obviously blocked and filtered. One of the things that has happened as a result of one-to-one programs is parents ask school, how do you guys do that? I would like to do that. And or they say to, the, to their children, like, well, while you're at home, you need to use your school device and only your school device because they don't necessarily know how to set up, you know, router-based filtering or buying, finding a filtering service and all of that. So I think one of the ways that we are helping, and it's not necessarily a direct or purposeful, but indirectly, is that there's a model being shown that we can create ecosystems in which kids can utilize technology and take advantage of technology and also do so safely and in a way that we, you know, aligns with the desires we have for them to, you know, be protected and be exposed to things we want them exposed to, as opposed to things we don't. I love it. Okay. I want to ask you one for a follow-up question to round it out. All of our listeners listening right now, we're so grateful for directors and superintendents and CTOs, just like what we have right now on the program. And all of you out there who are struggling with these struggles, remember, we're here for you. If you ever need it, you can go to smartsocial.com. There's a search box at the top. There's 450 resources. Every district leader gets a free demo pass to look through my incredible Army of Parents research team's uh, work because we're doing all the hard work for you to create the resources to help smaller districts and bigger districts engage parents. So we love all of you. Superintendent and CTO, I've got a follow-up question for you. What is your biggest social media concern for the future? Superintendent, I'd like to start with you first. Beside the issue we talked about, students being safe on social media, that, that's so important to me. And, and obviously, we've talked about that. I think what we've found by utilizing social media and opening it up to our community is the misinformation that's shared on social media. So that, that's probably uh, what's particularly challenging and frustrating, especially during the pandemic. There was so much misinformation that was shared on social media that we had to spend a lot of time trying to counteract and, and clean up. And then, so you counteract misinformation with more and more information. So it was information overload. So I would just say that the misinformation campaigns that happen on social media, also the fact that some of our parents utilize social media when they're unhappy, rather than reaching out through other avenues, 
So as a school division, we have to make sure we create opportunities, for parents to feel heard and that their challenges are addressed in a timely manner. So they don't have to, to go through social media to air all of their challenges to the world. Yeah. And, and I'll follow up with that. So Hans Rosling, who wrote a book called Factfulness is, is one of my, my favorite authors and one of my favorite pieces of work. I mean, he talks about these different instincts that we have. And, and I think the gap instinct, which, which Hans Rosling put out there and basically helped to define the human tendency towards dividing everything into one of two groups. You're either us or them, you're A or B, your heads or tails. Unfortunately, I think that, that social media is continuing to accentuate that and even amplify that, that effect where when we sit down across the table from each other, we might have eight different perspectives somehow or another on, on Facebook, we believe that we have two, everybody has two. If you pick a topic, there's two sides to that topic. And so I think that between the disinformation, misinformation campaigns we see on, you know, Facebook that Dr. Cotton alluded to and this us and them phenomenon, this gap instinct. I think that those two things are potentially really damaging to society at large and to humanity. And, and I worry about how we reduce those effects, given what we've seen and what we know about how social media has a tendency to amplify those things. Okay, I want to thank both of you to our amazing guests here today. The rest of us, are, if you're a district looking to engage parents, or if you're a parent looking for ideas on how to protect your kids online so they someday shine online for the future, we have some exciting new events coming up. Parents, you can pile in in multi-languages. It's in English, in Espanol, replays in Mandarin, and we're in 10 other languages. And you can bring all of your questions. It's a 30-minute program. My incredible army of researchers. Shout out to everybody there. They are doing all the hard work. We're putting real teens in the program, real incredible psychologists, therapists, counselors. And then you'll see me with some tactical and practical tips with our passion here at Smart Social. So come one, come all. Our live events are next week. If you miss them, you can watch the replay at any time. If your school district has partnered with you, use their special link to gain full access to our platform. Thank you to everyone. We're here to keep kids safe on social media. That's number one, so they can someday shine online. These tools are too good not to use. We want your, all of your students to be 25 and employable, resilient, awesome, happy, and engaged. Uh, that's our dream here at smartsocial.com. Thank you to our guests here today and thanks to everybody else and shout out to my incredible team who's saving lives all over the world. We'll see all of you very soon. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for listening to our smartsocial.com podcast. I'm your host, Josh Oaks. This was our district talk segment where we interview school district leaders to learn how they're keeping students safe on social media so those students can someday launch into their future by shining online. This episode was brought to you by our smartsocial.com VIP program. It's called the Very Informed Parent Program, which helps you engage your students with teen-led video lessons. Stay one step ahead with our premium parent newsletter and discover hidden features on trending apps on teens' phones and our 54 plus live parent and student-friendly events every single year. You can click on the link below to chat with one of our team members if you want a free pass to our VIP program to support your community with our smartsocial.com resources. And if you're a district leader who has a success story, we would love to feature you on a future episode. You can click the links below to reach out. Thanks so much for listening, and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Have a great day.